Hello, this is Josh Carr at The Real Angle, and today I've got a, a bunch of people uh, from Montgomery Partners. Uh, and uh, so let's, let's start with the basics. Let's do some introductions. Let's talk about what Montgomery does, and then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, Spencer, you want to kick us off? Fantastic. Well, as Josh said, my name is Spencer Palmer. I'm the Vice President of Investments. Um, Montgomery Partners is a quasi family office and syndication group. We were founded in the early 1980s by my father, John Palmer. Um, I myself am in charge of the investments. I underwrite the deals. I will travel to new markets, source all of them, do the underwriting, uh, source the debt as well before I pass it off to uh, my brother in arms, Brady Badger. There we go. Hi there, Josh, thanks for having us on. Um, so Brady Badger, I, Sort of take the take the baton from from Spencer and uh, run the fundraising side for for the company, um, as well as client relations and sort of managing the day to day you know needs of the client. Um, but once we've gotten to that point, we've raised the money, we've closed the deal, then it's really on to our our other brother in arms, Brady Stern. And yes, there are two Bradys in our company, and it does get confusing. So we apologize. So for do that. you do like do you do like Brady B and Brader S, or do you, or do you have like yeah? The so it's house usually Brady B, Brady S, or it's B B B S, or it's I don't know. We call each other by our last name, or our first name. It never gets confusing, so we really don't have to delineate. There we go. There we go. No, you need, you need to do what they do did in the movie Animal House. You need like frat brother names, like call one of. Uh, well, we're, we're we're working on that. We're working on that. Yeah. No, that's 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 really. Uh, you can tell I'm definitely a product of another generation where I'm like we should have frat brother names. That would be a a good inclusive environment in the workplace. So, good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, just, nonetheless. Yeah. Two minutes in, it didn't take long to hit on the national lampoons. Um, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing what I can. It's a, it's a classic, and there's nothing wrong with that movie. But nonetheless, uh, so then it moves over to Brady Stern, and and Brady Stern, you do uh, like asset management essentially. Correct. Operating. Yeah, I serve as uh, chief operating officer at Montgomery Partners, um, head asset management and property management here as well. I've been here about two and a half years now. Uh, bring past investment real estate experience from. UBS on the institutional side and Carmel Partners on the development side. Uh, and just a personal anecdote with Josh, um, my Columbia colleagues in the past have all spoke highly of the famous Josh Carr. And I was excited for the opportunity about 10 years ago to go to New York for a week and take your financial modeling class. And that was really the, the genesis for this relationship. Well, um, there we go. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. I, I yes, appreciate exactly. it when someone else can can plug me rather than myself. So that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Nonetheless, it's always, it's always appreciated. So, so, so let's talk about what, what Montgomery partners does just from a, a market standpoint, a product type standpoint, what, what, what do you guys buy and what markets are you in? Of course, I'll take this one. You know, we're sure. long-term value add investors. I say our average whole time is five to seven years. We play in the multifamily value add space. Um, I'd say our markets right now that we're really focused and very bullish on is kind of the Denver West space. We currently own and operate in California, Colorado, and Nevada, although we're actively bidding on deals in, in Utah, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. I'd say our thesis is, you know, the C plus to B plus space, kind of that upper workforce housing. Um, 50 okay. to about 200 units is kind of our sweet spot, anywhere from 10 to kind of 45 million is, is the is a ton of the total deal size for us. Um, again, our goal is to bring kind of that, that lower quality deal. So that's that C plus B minus deal in a great neighborhood up to a, a B plus level. And we're going to do that through a, an active interior and exterior kind of renovation play, um, renovating okay. anywhere from half to three quarter of the interior units and doing a, you know, a massive exterior play as well. Typically adding common area amenities, um, doing deferred maintenance as soon as we can, um, the typical kind of strategy there. Um, you know, I, I think what differentiates us from other groups right now is, is the longer term strategy. I think a lot of people got really used to the quick flip model over the last couple of years, the kind of two and three years. Sure. sure. We try to always be in that five, seven and kind of 10 year category. We're oftentimes doing, you know, fixed rate debt throughout the entirety, um, oftentimes interest only, although we have taken some loans with a, with a bit of a hybrid there. Um, and that's mainly coming through agency relationships and banks. Um, we're, we're big believers in, you know, you, you buy a really quality asset at a, at a great basis and you hold for long term and really um, continue to add value there as, as best you can. 
So, so let me zoom in a little bit on the market thing. Like what, if you had to pick one market right now that you're really hot on and one market that maybe you were cold on, which, which market are you loving? Which market are you loving less? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's been a ton of development in a lot of these markets that saw amazing red growth. You can look at Raleigh, um, Phoenix, Denver's a great one, Salt Lake City, um, Boise. These are markets we were very, very bullish on and still are, you know, over, and, and will be over the next couple of years. But I think we need to kind of work through that glut of development that's happening. You know, there's more deliveries coming forth in 2024 than there were in 2023. And we have not seen this number of deliveries happen since kind of the mid to late 80s. So I think a lot of that needs to get worked through. Now, I'm not, I, I believe those markets have the demand for, which is something that not a lot of people are talking about right now. And I, they will sustain it. But I think there will be a concession game that kind of gets, that's played there. So that's kind of the, the markets I'm, I'm, I'm not as hot on as I was. But I, you know, I still want to continue to look at and watch. I think a bit of a contrarian view right now is that we are dipping our toe back into California, which is where we've been, you know, focused for the last you know, 40 years. Hmm. I think California kind of got a bad rap for, you know, a number of reasons, whether it be, you know, political issues or the inability to build. But because of that, you know, everyone saw during the pandemic, every deal across the country basically go to a three and a half cap, right? And right. the rental story was there because they were basically catching up to what the national average could be. But if you look back at California, you know, we've seen very, very steady red growth in a lot of these markets, and it's it's very, very difficult to build in. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're digging back into both Northern and Southern California, as well as Central California, much more so than I think we were a couple of years ago. Interesting. Interesting. No, it's it's always fun to ask people. I mean, the, the question about, you know, long term rent growth, I mean, definitely a lot of people are chatting now about, well, there's huge amounts of supply and is that oversupply? And at the same time. You know, there seems to be an amazing amount of young people who are basically still living at their parents' houses looking for that first place. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for housing. So it, right. it's going to be interesting to see, you know, which wins out on that conversation. Um, Not only that, I think the sentiment has really shifted too with the younger generations, both millennial and, and Gen Z's where the affordability component of owning your own home versus renting, you know, there's never been a wider gap. So I think yeah. it's been what, what happened was for a long time, there was this renter by necessity category and there was a renter by, by choice. And I think right. what's happening now is that renter by choice category is growing a lot larger than anybody really expected. And because of that, to your point, a lot of the supply will be eaten up and frankly taken over by these younger generations who are choosing to know what their monthly you know, cost is going to be with rent versus having unexpected costs and, and a mortgage to pay, you know, the freedom to choose and move now so is, is more evident than it's ever been before. No, and, and the freedom of move is an interesting thing. I mean, you're younger. I, I kid around that the younger generation is the Netflix generation in that they want everything on a monthly subscription and they want to be able to cancel everything at a moment's notice, like just everything, yeah. you know, which, which is for someone who's of a different generation, I'm always like, well, you have to live somewhere, so buy a house. Whereas the earlier generation is like, no, what if I want to like, move to the East Coast tomorrow. And it's like, yeah, but you're not going to. But yet they, they want that flexibility and they'll pay for that flexibility. So it's 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 interesting to me. It's interesting. Sure. Yeah, there's definitely been an evolution. And I think it'll be curious to see what the one bedroom, two bedroom mix looks down the road because as people increasingly are putting off, you know, settling down, having kids longer and longer and longer, unit mix is going to be part of the conversation too. But nonetheless, so... So markets, we talked about markets you're hot on. You're into residential. You're not doing anything else. No retail, no office. It's really a pure resi strategy is what you guys have done. Correct. Yep. Now, now I guess this is a question more for Brady from a, from a money raising side, unless I'm incorrect. Most of the equity you bring in is sort of traditional syndication. You're raising money from limited partners, from a pool of people. Um do you like the they like the fact that you're giving them consistent apartment assets, right? That's kind of what their the feed is, if you will. Like, yeah, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, I guess the question is just, I mean, because I've done syndication myself. Do you ever have investors who are like, hey, do you have anything else? Like, I'm sick of doing apartment deals in Denver. Like, what else do you have? Or are they really they like yeah. the fact that they're getting consistency out of you? I would say, um, generally speaking. People come to us because they know that we, for 40 years, have been buying and selling apartments and we've done well doing that. And so right. there is that sort of tradition of, or tradition or, or track record rather, that um, has kept our 300 or so 
uh, high net worth individuals and families in our in our stable consistently coming back and re-upping for the next one. Um, right. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who ask us, hey, are, are you doing industrial or hey, are you doing self-storage or whatever it might be? Are you dipping your toes into office market in San Francisco because, you know, there's big discounts? They read um, the I think <laughs> yeah, they, they're paying attention to the news. Um, you know, I, I think we're very cognizant of what we're good at and what we know we can uh, execute on. Um, and I think a big piece of that is, again, I, I'll reiterate it again, is that we've been around for 40 years. You know, it's like sure. John, our, our founder, Spencer's father, has and, and our other general partner, Mike Pirro, have done a, fan a fantastic job at helping to keep the ship going straight. You know, I mean, really making sure that we deliver regularly to our investors doesn't mean we haven't had our challenges. doesn't mean we haven't had a few investments not go do as well as we would like. It's 40 um, years. Things 40 are going years. to go wrong. Yeah. Sure. You're, you're going to have a you're going to have a few singles. Right. I mean, you're, it's just, or a few strikeouts. But you're, you know, generally speaking, we come around to home base. And so that's right. that's really, you know, what we try to continue to do, even as we look to expand in other markets. What I'm also hearing, and maybe I'm reading between the lines too, is that, you know, part of it is also about just operational issues. And by that, I mean, it's more than just you do a deal, you do another deal. It's also because you've been doing it for 40 years. It's an operating business. Like people, a lot of times right. in our industry, I think, underappreciate that it's more than just doing a deal. It's like, no, you're building a franchise, a business, you have relationships, there's a machine, which is more than just we own some buildings. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're you're kind of addressing there too. That's yeah, I mean, it, it's it, interesting. It really is. It, it, it really comes down to the day in and day out. And I think that's where Brady Stern really comes into the fold is his his side of the business. Um, and I'll let him talk, but it's, you know, it, if we if we can't execute on the operations, then we're not doing our job. We're not gonna have the returns and we're not gonna have the repeat investor clients. So, so yeah, I guess Brady, I'll throw it over to other, other Brady just to talk a little bit about <laughs> operational stuff. Like what's, what what what's the op what's the life of the operator look like these days? I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's uh, it's incre it's increasingly challenging for sure. I'd love to say there's some secret sauce that differentiates Montgomery Partners from our competitors, but at the end of the day, I think it really boils down to what's our experience and what are the relationships that we have. Uh, Brady mentioned and touched on it. We've been syndicating deals for forty years and have this great track record. Uh, what does that look like on the operation side? Uh, so we have in-house property management within California. Uh, and we have third-party property management from both AMC and FPI out of state. So it's a formula that works pretty well for us. Um, getting a little bit into the weeds on the operation side, it's tough right now. It's a tough climate. We're anticipating market rent growth somewhere between being flat and maybe 2% on an upside scenario this next year. Um, right. As we get through oncoming supply, uh, we need to get that absorbed before we can start pushing again. But that gets outweighed on the expense side by operating in an inflationary environment. Everything's more expensive. Insurance is more expensive. We're seeing increases of two to three X on some properties. Uh, the labor market's really tight, hiring for both front of house, back of house staff, um, and then contracting repair folks. Anytime you need to get a plumber, an electrician, a painter, any vendor out, uh, there's just so much demand for their services right now uh, that we're, we're scratching and clawing trying to keep NOI stable in 2024 on some of these properties. But Yeah, no, no one's going into the trades. I mean, I, I saw an interesting article was talking about the growth of the projected growth of solar. And someone was just doing the math, the obvious statement, which is, well, if you're going to put all these solar panels on, you're going to need a lot of electricians. We don't physically have enough electricians to do the work. So... So now what, you know, and, and you I can't just train, ele training an electrician is not like a gas station attendant. I mean, it's, it, it, it takes some skill and some training before you should be doing that kind of job. Um, yeah. I try to differentiate what, what are Montgomery partners specific problems and what are industry general problems? These are you know problems that everyone in the industry is facing. Uh, oh, we all, are. Yeah. yeah. I think what differentiates us a little bit is just on the relationship, on the relationship side, having these longstanding ties to general contractors and property managers and you know, brokers, investors, lenders. Um, that's something that really differentiates us and serves us well. It's, they um, return your call first. Sure. They get yeah, probably the best example of a boat that I can point to from, you know, what we're doing to someone that's just starting out in the industry. 
So I guess here's a question I always like to ask, which is on a recent deal, and this could either be an acquisitions issue or an operations issue. Uh, surprises, good or bad, things never go as expected. Sometimes you unexpectedly have happy accidents. Sometimes you have a mess. Any, any uh, good recent surprises that we've encountered, either from an operational standpoint or a deal standpoint? Hmm. Stern, I think this would be a good one to talk about with Nueva Vista and Palms, kind of how that kind of that deal came together and, and you know, how we've been approaching it, just because that's a very unique um, purchase compared to what we've done in the past. Sure. Uh, I guess two acquisitions that we can spotlight from 2023 uh, th this past year. First one, 74 units. Uh, fully marketed in Santa Rosa, California. Um, Santa Rosa, just by way of perspective, is the largest city between San Francisco and Portland, and where we have pretty great presence with uh, five or six current buildings there. Uh, we acquired this property that had about half of the units vacant, um, and there was a fire and a flood from the previous ownership, and they hadn't backfilled the units, uh, released the units. So for us, Sorry, we really a fire and things. a flood? Was that was yeah. Yeah. Fire? yeah. Just was this missing, one event? Uh, like they had a fire yeah. and they flooded it? Like, do you mean the fire department two, flooded it or like just? Yeah, two, <laughs> two, two, two separate events, I believe, but it's not often, uh, you know, you can acquire a property like that with 50% wow. uh, vacancy. And for us, you okay. know, that just screams upside on getting to get in there and renovate the units and uh, really aggressively reposition it, which you don't find very often. Uh, one of our yeah, challenges, yeah, one of our challenges is just being able to, um, you know, renovate the units timely when you've got pretty high retention rates from, from residents. So we were able to get in there uh, over the course of five or six months, renovate uh, about 30 of the units uh, in addition to some common area heavy lifting. So we felt pretty good about that one. But, but probably the biggest surprise is the, uh, the, the counter to that with some of the other acquisitions that we've had recently, just not seeing as many move outs as we've seen historically. Um, hmm. Our retention rate's probably closer to 70%, where I think of industry average uh, being closer to 55%. So, and you know, it's great, you you out, yeah, it's great if you can send out. Yeah, uh, it's great if you can send out. Yeah, it's hard to say. I think part of it's probably uh, we're limited on the increases that we can send out in California with AB 1482. Uh, in most markets in California, it's 5% plus CPI. Um, so it's not unlimited. You can't just go to market. Sure, sure, sure. You, you can't go to market. So, right. you know, if the downside of that is we send out renewals of, you know, eight to 10% and people take them, we're not having to do any of the renovation work, then you know, that's not the, the worst case scenario. Uh, it's not the worst thing to happen to us. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. No, uh, the, the availability of units, again, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of supply coming down the pipeline, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see what, what it hits. And it's going to hit different markets differently, I mean, just because that's the nature of the beast. Um, well, that's interesting. So, you know, the market for the last year has been challenging, I guess would be a good way of putting it. Interest rates have been bouncing all over the place. You know, we the bid ask spread is wider than I've seen in quite some time in terms of you know cap rates that people are asking versus where things are settling at. Uh, I mean, I know personally I've got a deal in the market right now, and I'm getting very different answers on value from a lender, from potential buyers, from the tax appeal person. What's your sense of like like 23s in the rearview mirror? What does 2024 look like? What what are you guys thinking of for 2024? Um, I think it's kind of a two-part answer because I think there's there's different strategies for us versus other people. I think overall okay. we're very bullish on 2024. 20, you know, I think the deals we're seeing and that that are penciling right now, like we're chasing a couple off-market portfolios ourselves, and you know, we haven't seen these kind of return metrics maybe at best since 2010, 2011. Yeah. I mean, it's been it's been a solid decade since then. So on that hand, you know, we're very bullish. You know, I think you have to contrast that view with the fact that I'm not entirely sure we're going to miss a recession here. You know, I think, you know, not to put, you know, too much on the Fed, but they're always a little slow to react. And, you know, they were slow to put the brakes on. And, and if you look at certain indices, you know, we're already below that two or three percent threshold right now, even though, you know, the new CPI print came out today and said, hey, you know, it's it's going up. You're like, well, rear view looking, but sure. OK, we can talk about that another time. Um, right, right. But, you know, I think they're going to be slow to take the brakes off as well. And because of that, you know, we could be in in a situation where we find ourselves seeing the the employment rate go up and you know if, if we're looking at where the employment rate is right now we're, we're back to like 3.7 3.8 
you know, if you look at where labor participation was, you know, two to three years ago, if you use those numbers, you know, we're between four and 5%. So we've seen it go up a considerable amount. We're not necessarily giving that much of the conversation, the credit it deserves. And for groups like ours who play in that C plus to kind of B plus space and the upper workforce housing and that renter by necessity category, you know, we're very aware of what's happening with the unemployment and frankly, where, where wage and job growth is. We have to be. So, you know, contrasting the two, you know, there's gonna be a lot of deliveries in 2024 for this new construction deals where they just don't pencil and the takeouts won't work. So we need to go to the market, either bring in a, you know, a new joint venture partnership to take them out, a, a prep equity slice, or they might just need to sell it at a loss. So when you look at these deals, 2024 and 2025, look to have everything we're, we're talking about in terms of putting the foot back on the gas. But again, from our perspective, because we hold long term, you know, if we can get a deal to pencil now with fixed rate, fixed rate loans with interest only and, you know, moderate le leverage levels between 55 and 65 percent, you know, we're going to chase those deals all day long. But I think there's going to be a, a very there's going to be a lot of competition for the newer stuff. So I think looking between 80s, 90s, and early 2000s vintage is going to be very fruitful for us over the next five to 10 years. So, so follow up question, because you mentioned, you talk about like, you know, that these guys are going to have a, a list of options, right? They could sell it. They could, as you said, bring in a partner, pref equity position, what have you. And I know traditionally your business model has been, you guys, but you just buy the buildings, get fixed rate debt. Have you considered or are you open to doing stuff that's more like, hey, maybe we will take an equity piece. Maybe we will come in as that joint venture guy. Or are you really looking to just do straight fee, simple real estate? We're looking at every option right now. I mean, we've we've never bought new construction. We haven't played in the JV space, but we are creating those JV relationships. You know, I, I think it's going to be just where is the best use of capital. I think one thing we can we can all acknowledge is that capital has become very agnostic over the last ten to twenty years. You know, I think there was a there was a slice of people that really understood real estate, and that's where they played. And there's people that understood stocks and bonds, that's where they played. But now, with with the math being what it is, you can you can correlate those two very easily and say, hey, where's my best return? both with and without the tax advantages. So I think from our perspective, there's gonna be opportunities to play in that JV space, in that prep space and participate in some of these raises and, and go in with funds and, and do you know different investment projects we haven't looked at before. But I think our bread and butter is continue to be buy and operate deals that we own ourselves. And maybe we bring in you know a JV partner or a large co-JP to do that with us. Rather than build like a high yield debt fund and have that be a whole different yeah. business model that you get into. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, and I think that's always an interesting question. Like, you know, it sort of gets back to the, you could do a one off thing, but you, if you're going to do it, you want it to be a strategy and really grow it rather than just some random one off deal. And that gets back to, I guess, also the job of raising money, which is you have a track record of you do one thing really, really well. So you don't want to just sort of throw out random ideas and see if it'll work. Um, right. And I think that's also where, you know, Spencer mentioned just sort of the, how we're kind of looking at different options. And we really have been spending a lot of time on because people are sort of agnostic, as long as they can invest in real estate, whether that's, you know, with us and, you know, sort of as a GP and a, and a, and a syndicated deal or that's, you know, in REITs, everyone kind of want, knows they need to have a real estate allocation as part of their 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 overall net worth or their pie, if you will. Um, and what we're trying to tap into is really getting, building on that 300 plus, you know, client base that we have, and that may be with some strategic partnerships, whether they're joint venture or, you know, simply, uh, you know, a family office that decides they want to start investing with us, um, or a co GP situation. Um, but we're open to those ideas and we, we frankly welcome them because that's, what's going to allow us to push sort of push the envelope a little bit and keep growing the way we would like to and go into these markets that we've been talking about. Um, right. Because at some point you can't, you can only go to your existing clientele so many times over, over a certain number of years. Eventually they start saying, I don't have any more checks to write right now. And so, right. and fortunately we're not there. Yeah, exactly. Like fortunately we're not there, but, but we know that we, you have to replenish and you kind of have to refresh the water um, and, and, and build on it. And that's what we're trying to do now. No. And look, what you're doing is admirable. I mean, this is, this is the right way of doing it. You know, I mean, there are a lot of guys out there who, you know, I don't want to beat up on the crowdfunding people too much, but you know, 
there, there's, there's, there's other ways to raise money. You definitely are doing it the more traditional way, uh, where you're building relationships over a long term, uh, rather than lots of little guys with lots of little checks and that sort of thing. No, it, it's curious. It's curious. So, look, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about the macroeconomics. I guess a couple other questions I have, just, and this is just my own personal curiosity. You know, I know you guys do a lot of stuff in California. You know, solar continues to be in the news, and I know I mentioned it just in passing about electricians and shortages and that sort of thing. Um, and we also talking about expenses going up a lot. Is that something that you guys have gotten into, or is that something that hasn't happened yet for you guys? Because it seems like everyone's putting solar on their roofs all over the darn place. I would it's say we're always, yeah, we're, we're always looking for ancillary, ancillary revenue opportunities, and I think you have to try. Uh, and dig deeper in a market like this where expenses are growing up and rent growth is flat. So what, what do ancillary, ancillary uh, opportunities look like? Solar is definitely one of them. EV charging, uh, the parcel pending package lockers that you can charge back for. Um, anything and everything under the sun, I think we're evaluating. We don't have anything in our current portfolio right now, but I think that's probably the uh, the next box to check is trying to figure out solar and um, one that we've had yeah, and the EV with. thing's interesting because, again, I mean, you know, penetration of EVs, California's been leading the market for EV charging penetration. But you guys probably, because you're more workforce product, you don't have people driving $100,000 Rivians all over the place, probably your property. So that's probably... No, it's thing. something we've talked about, something we've talked about in recent months. And I think you're exactly right, Josh. You drive these properties and they're not filled with the, the Teslas, the Rivians, the, the EVs. There's just not a lot of demand from our renter base right now like there would be at... Uh, you know, name whatever class A property um, in the major urban markets. Um, we've yeah, had I mean, little... but for, for, for what it's worth, and I mean, we're recording this January 11th. Uh, today's news, yesterday's news was, I guess, Hertz is dropping uh, something like 20,000 low cost Teslas to the market that they want to get off their portfolio. And I, for kicks, I pulled it up this morning, and I guess they're dumping Tesla Model 3s for like low $20,000 range, you know, mm -hmm. so 20, 21 grand. You know, that's a working man's car. So yeah. uh, just figured figured I'd ask. It's just in the Yeah, next. and it, it's a good and it's a good question. As Brady Brady said, you know, it's something in the last couple of months we have started talking about because as you just pointed out, the cost of owning an electric car is coming down dramatically just to, to buy whether it's a used one or even a new one. Um, and so those are, you know, like you said, twenty, twenty five thousand dollars is a working man's car. And they're going to be there at some point in the next few years, they're going to start saying, Hey, I need to charge my car. Um, and we actually, you know, it's timely because we actually have a, we're setting up a meeting with a infrastructure solar panel uh, guy that we're supposed to talk to this next week. So, you know, it's something we're, we're looking at, but you know, we're not there yet, but we definitely want to understand what the market is and how and what ways it could generate additional revenue as Brady pointed out for the properties. No, I, I, you know, I like to ask these questions because, I mean, I keep seeing all these high level policy conversations among various political officials about what they they want the future to look like. But at the end of the day, you guys actually have to implement. So, like, it's it's all fine and good for government folk to be like, we're doing this. And then it's like, yeah, but who's running the actual electrical line in the parking lot? Like, how do we actually yeah. physically get this done? Uh, it's uh, not glamorous, but we got to do it. We gotta Interesting do it. enough, California also can't get any more, you know, power in, right? It's got to be created somewhere because the grid is already at its maximum. You know, just as they, as you know, as they went out and said, everyone's got to have a car, an electric car by like 2035. I think two weeks later, they have the rolling blackouts. So it's yeah. a, it's a great idea. Um, I think California needs to get a little bit, you know, back behind, you know, the different skis to figure out exactly how to implement this first. But no, I mean, I think the costs are coming down across the board, both of the cars, the solar panels and the technology itself. And as soon as that happens, the implementation will be kind of across the board. Yeah. And it's fun. I mean, that's why I'm talking about this with you guys, because it's interesting because real estate people by our nature, we tend to be pretty conservative in our ways because it's a pretty straightforward business, but you know, periodically the, the game changes and we need to evolve. Um, well, this is good. Look, we talked a little bit and, and I guess my only other question was, your deals really, they're all kind of their own separate syndications. Like each deal rises and falls on its own. And then you kind of have the operating business. And I guess here's the last question. This is for Brady Stern. You mentioned that you guys have a property management company, which is pretty active in California and you manage your stuff. Have you expanded it into third party management or is it all sort of like you manage your own stuff and that's what you do? Yeah, we have a pretty robust third party property management company within uh, California. So we self-manage within California. 
We have a regional manager in the uh, Northern California. We have a regional manager specific to our San Francisco portfolio, and then another regional manager who's been with us for 20 years in Southern California. But are you managing properties for other owners, or it's just you guys are managing your own stuff? It's all self-managed. All, all, other, all your own thing. Yeah. Other owners are a pain in the ass to work for. I, I know we, we can we can be. I just figured I'd ask. Yeah. It's uh, and and I don't think that's a I don't think that's a wrong response. I think a lot of people when they get into third party management, they do it more as a a way to see what owners want to get rid of stuff or something. And then anyone that challenges that is lying to themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it's. I just figured I'd ask. I figured, yeah. I think also, especially with what you guys are doing. I mean, look, not to tell you what to do, or what not to do, but especially with some of the uh, workforce housing stuff, where it's not Class A product and it's local, it makes a lot of sense for you guys to. Uh, I'm going to sound like a northeasterner, you know. Say, uh, you know, plow your own snow. I know that's not an issue, for you, <laughs> but but that's the way I think of it. Is sort of do your own. You know, mow your own lawns, do it yourself. So yeah. that's good. That's good. Well, look, this is very, very constructive. I guess uh, any closing thoughts on where we end up? I guess we talked a little bit about possible recession. We talked about supply. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to hit. Um, I think we kind of worked through it. Any other thoughts? We good? good. I, I mean, I think just kind of in, in you know, in closing and kind of where we think we're going, at, you know, we're, as Spencer said, you know, we're, we are, optimistic and, and bullish on this year and next year and the next coming years. And, but I would, I would say that we're cautiously optimistic, right? I mean, we, you know, we're, we're very much, you know, every day we kind of talk about what the headlines are and we kind of, you know, we are following the interest rates. We are following the fed. Um, but that being said, you know, we are seeing deals that pencil, you know, I mean, we're seeing deals that make sense. Um, and we're actively, you know, in discussing raising funds, you know, a lot of people have a lot of money sitting on the sides right now. You know, the last two years, a lot of people just didn't invest when, you know, they didn't have checks to write because they didn't want to risk the, the potential up, you know, upswing in interest rates. So I hear you. We, and they were getting 5%, then they were getting 5% yeah, of the they, high yield savings account. So they just said, I'll make 5% with no risk or I'll go with you guys and make, you know, 10 completely. That was our, that was sort of the second half of last year was, you know, <laughs> Everyone said, well, I've already put my money at five, five and a half percent in a CD I, and I can't touch it till next year. So call me next year, you know, and, and so we're calling them, you know, and we are reaching out to them and we're saying, hey, we are looking at stuff. Keep your powder dry. Um, and I so, think so as I, a, as a, go ahead. So I guess here's my question for you. And I guess last question, because this is an ongoing debate I've been having with a number of people in my network. When people jump back in, are you of the mindset that it will be? A, like everyone all at once or do you think it's going to like trickle out like what do you think it's going to look like is this a tidal wave money turns on or is this a 24 month think, type thing if you had to bet i think once the spigot back comes back on yeah i think once the spigot comes back on it'll come on pretty quickly but i think it'll take a couple of big groups dipping their toes in i mean you saw true america make some really good trades mg has made some really good trades in the past couple months i mean the bigger guys who who see opportunity here have already dipped their toes back in us included buying you know two deals in 2023 i think I don't want to say we found the bottom or past it, but you never know when you're going to hit the bottom, right? So if you see a deal with pencils now, make it work. But yeah. there, there is, quote unquote, a lot of dry powder on the sidelines. And, you know, if that doesn't get called, it might get put into something else. So I think when the market does swing back, it'll swing back very quickly. But I think the, the 2024 will be slower, but then 2025 and going to 2026 will be back to where we were in, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, then for everyone listening, just because I didn't mention at the beginning, I always try to. If you want to check out their website, it's at MontgomeryPartners.com. Common spelling. I'm sure you'll be able to find it on the Internet. And thanks again, everyone. This has been Josh Carr of The Real Angle. And thank you to Spencer, Brady, and Brady, though I really do want to call one of you Flounder. I really do. <laughs> I will withhold, withhold that need. Uh, thanks again, guys. Much appreciated. Thanks, Josh. Thank Much you, appreciated. Josh. Take care.